Good afternoon. On behalf of the NMC and Media Technology, a professional network of the American Alliance of Museums, we are delighted to welcome you to Open Licensing. What is it? Why do it? In this one-hour discussion, a panel of experts will explore a variety of ways that cultural institutions such as galleries, libraries, archives, and museums can apply open licensing to their collections, as well as how this type of licensing benefits both institutions and their audiences. I'm Alex Freeman, Director of Membership and Programs at the NMC. I'm here to assist with technical support. Please feel free to ask any questions via the Q&A if you have any, uh, encounter any technical problems. If you don't see the Q&A box immediately, then click on the white nine squared cube to switch between the Q&A and showcase feature, which is an area that will contain links and resources. So sit back, get comfortable, and enjoy the following discussion. But first, a bit of logistics. In this session, if you have a question, you can type it into the Q&A and also plus one a question that you're interested in having answered. We'll collect your questions throughout the program and try to weave them in as we can. Um, we're also going to be active on Twitter today, so uh, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag AAM underscore NMC. That's hashtag AAM underscore NMC. Uh, now on to the host of today's program, Amelia Wong. Amelia is the Assistant Professor of Museum Studies at George Washington University and Chair of Education and Webinars for Media and Technology. Take it away, Amelia. Thanks, Alex. I want to extend my welcome to the audience as well today. Uh, thank you for joining us for our first program with the New Media Consortium and our first program using Google Hangouts. Media and Technology is one of AAM's 22 professional networks. We represent professionals in the museum field who specialize in technology for infrastructure and interpretation issues. We conduct technology training at the AAM annual meeting. We organize the annual AAM Muse, Muse Awards, which recognize outstanding achievement in museum media. And we host professional development programs like this one. Based on feedback from past programs, we know that uh, many in the museum field are interested in open licensing, learning more about it. So we are happy to bring to you today a panel of experts on the topic in the hope of furthering that conversation and inspiring people to do more. I'm thrilled to have today moderating our discussion Michael Edson. Many of you probably know Michael from his work leading digital strategy at the Smithsonian. He's also an advisor to the Open Knowledge Foundation and a Presidential Distinguished Fellow at the Council on Library and Information Sciences, all of which means he um, knows a ton about this, and I'm thrilled to have him. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Amelia, for all your work on this, and Alex and uh, Greg from the AAM as well, and a special thanks at the beginning to Susie Seraf, who is the chair of the Media and Technology Committee at AAM, and I think Susie's worked hard for more than a year to get this program uh, off the ground. So thanks, uh, AAM Media and Technology, and everyone from New Media Consortium and uh, the broader community. So here we are. Um, we have a tremendous panel today. And uh, for those of you dialing in, I understand we have between two and 300 people monitoring this uh, Hangout. We'll go till the top of the hour. And the format here is, um, we're going to talk and uh, have a casual uh, conversation about open content and open licensing. Um, you all follow Twitter, use the Q&A in the Hangout. Uh, Amelia and the, uh, uh, Greg and Alex will monitor that, feed us questions, and we'll take it from there. Um, and I want to make sure someone who's following along posts the URL for this stream to the Twitter hashtag, which is uh, AAM underscore NMC. So with no further ado, uh, let me introduce the panel today. Um, I'll go down the line from left to right, and uh, why don't each of you say a little bit about yourself and about your relationship with uh, open content as we get into it. So on my left is Diane Peters from Creative Commons. Hi, Diane. So I'm the General Counsel of Creative Commons. Um, I have had the privilege of having this spot now for more years than I can probably count. Um, open content means a lot to me. Um, I love enabling people to share through our tools, um, keeping them vibrant and relevant for the rest of the community, and I particularly love seeing them be picked up by museums and other GLAM institutions as a way of really increasing their impact. Um, I really appreciate being here today, and I look forward to the discussion. It's so good to have you here. Um, and we understand there's new news. Um, 
regarding the uh, uh, Museum of Modern Art and the Creative Commons logo? Yeah. What's that, Diane? No, exciting news. Um, MoMA has agreed to acquire um, rights to incorporate our logos into their permanent collection. Um, we announced that yesterday on our blog. Um, the idea behind the exhibit is to uh, honor those symbols that make everyday life uh, usable and a reality for people, especially on the internet. And so um, check out our website for a blog post on that, and there'll be a further blog post talking about our design principles, etc. tomorrow. So um, thanks so much to MoMA and to the two designers who helped us uh, develop our logo system. That's really cool. Um, next in the lineup is Peter Duker from the National Gallery of Art. Hi, Peter. I'm at the National Gallery of Art. We started uh, our open access policy for works of art presumed in the public domain in 2012. Since then, we've had over a million images downloaded from our website, which is uh, images.nga.gov. So I'm excited to be here to talk about our experiences with that. Super cool. And next to Peter is Rob Lansfield from the Davis and Art Center in Wesleyan University, Middletown, Connecticut. Hey, Rob. Hey, Michael and everybody. Thanks for having me here. Um, open in our world really means uh, making things available for people to learn from. As a small museum that's nested within a university, our mission is fundamentally educational and making it easier for people to uh, get hold of images and information about the collection uh, serves that mission. Great to have you. And next to Rob is Sarah Sturch. Sarah, hello. Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Sturch. I am a museum consultant currently unaffiliated with a specific institution, but I have been um, contributing to the Open Glam and Glam Wiki, the latter, which is uh, Wikimedia partnerships, so Wikipedia, et cetera, with cultural institutions uh, for the, I guess, six years, past six years, which is almost like the beginning of uh, Open Glam and Glam Wiki. So I guess I'm kind of an old lady in the, in the world of that, uh, in the field. And I've, I've worked with many institutions and organizations, including the Smithsonian, and uh, look forward to uh, sharing my experience and thoughts and feelings with everybody. It's, Thanks for having me. It's great. It's great to have you. And I, I'll say we tried to compose this program so we have, you know, Sarah has sort of an insider-outsider view. Um, she's been a Wikipedian in residence. She's also worked closely with uh, the Wikipedia Foundation and the Wiklam Wiki movement. Rob is in a smaller organization that punches very big thanks to open content. Peter's in a big organization that had a very deliberate um, and very, uh, I'd say, impactful um, series of decisions about open content. And Diane, obviously, is with Creative Commons and sees across the whole global landscape of open content. So let me throw out a question. This is just uh, hanging out among friends, really. Rob, you're from a small organization. You know, what did you all have to gain from open content, open licensing? What is even open licensing? Well, in, in our space, we tend even not to attach the word licensing to it that much, uh, which has, for us, a, an aura of a former model, for the most part, where we would execute one-off permissions agreements for images, which is a very time-intensive kind of thing to do. On occasion, is still necessary, but rather than thinking of license by license, arrangements. We now have a blanket open access policy uh, which we apply to uh, any images of objects that we believe uh, firmly <laughs> to be in the public domain themselves. Um, and that enables us simply to make high resolution images of those objects uh, when available, uh, publicly downloadable uh, with reference to also a policy statement that people can download as well to find out what the terms are for that. Um, even the word terms is a little funny here uh, because it's not so much what you can or can't do is here's something for you to do with what you will, and here's what we're saying about it in a certain way. What was it like before, back in the old days? Right. Well, so we, we launched that policy in 2012, uh, several months after the National Gallery launched theirs. And prior to that, any time somebody wanted to use an image of a work in our collection, uh, we had a, what was a fairly typical process and still is uh, in many places, which would involve a lot of sort of back and forth one-on-one -on -one correspondence with the person requesting the image and forms that would get signed and countersigned and flown back and forth either by uh, postal carriers or fax machines or email attachments. And that works, uh, but it's, it's really time and energy intensive. And it is in many cases at least, especially in a place as small as ours, where almost any sort of 
activity is zero sum with other activities for uh, staff time, it was a huge time sink. Uh, and at this point, we're able to uh, not spend so much time executing those licensing agreements and spend more time doing things like uh, creating more images, pushing them live, and just streamlining that whole process. It also makes it much less painful for image requesters. We don't have to approach and ask and wait and pay in some cases. Uh, they can just grab the image, grab the policy, have a look at the policy, and uh, move on with whatever it was they actually wanted to do in the first place. Did you used to make money on this, uh, this your, your image access and licensing activities? Um, only if you were to look arbitrarily only at the revenue side, which is to say there were nominal fees. Uh, most of our image users tend to be academics. Uh, much of the use would either be um, directly, uh, well, educational in the direct instruction sense, or um, most often scholarly publication for which we would uh, waive or radically reduce fees for the most part anyway. Uh, but even in that case, if we would net out the typical amount of staff time it would take to see one of those permissions processes through on a one-off basis uh, with each request order. Uh, the time that it took uh, just to make that happen on our end was typically uh, more costly, ultimately, than the revenue side would have come into. So it was not even really cost recovery. It was something that looked like revenue, but was really um, a use of resources that could be used in more effective ways. Yeah. Let me, let me ask you a question about small institutions. And then I want to kind of pivot over to Stair Sturch, who has a, a perspective on what it means when institutions like yours open up, what that means to Wikipedia and Wikimedia and the broader community. So I, I think there's a, a, a sense among a lot of people that this open content content stuff, it's, it's great for you know, the Getty, it's great for the National Gallery of Art and the Rijksmuseum, but it's beyond the reach of small institutions. Um, how, how big are you, and, and was it hard to do? Right. Well, we, our collection is uh, about 24,000 objects, chiefly works of art on paper. Uh, we began as a print collection and now have substantial photographs. So um, small, small-ish in that sense. On the staff side, we're extremely small. We have two full-time positions and one half-time position, and that's it. Uh, and that's not just on the technology side or the image side. That's the entire uh, museum operation. So uh, when I say everything is zero-sum with a lot of other things for staff time, it's really true, and it cuts across domains that typically would be different departments in a, even a medium-sized institution. Okay. Um, how that plays for taking steps on the path towards providing more open access to these kinds of digital resources, um, it means on the one side there's great upside to... We lost Rob, but let me take it over to Sarah Sturch. Sarah, you've seen this from all the organizations you've worked from. They start opening up their, their collections, meaning they move from a, a really carefully controlled, licensed, copyright, one-at-a-time workflow to where they pre-approve content to be used en masse through Creative Commons licenses or by putting things in the open domain, uh, in the public domain. What, is that, what does that do for these organizations and how can you use that to help them do new things? Well, the, of, of course, aside from allowing the public to have access to your content without having to pay an arm and a leg, because uh, 50 bucks is a lot of money for the average human being who wants to you know, use a public domain artwork, which means it's the world owns it anyway, and you shouldn't be charging people for it, in my yeah. opinion, to use it. And we'll come back and define some of these terms later. So yes, yes. So um, it's it, it just it's it, one. It saves the public money, so I think it's really nice and uh, it lets us use it. But of course, most importantly, it, it allows it to be free and roam the world in a, in a broader way than it ever would just on your website or through a uh, restrictive license where we could get in trouble if we reuse it, right? So Wikipedia is one of those great examples. I'm sure if I asked everybody in the room, uh, all 300 plus of you, to raise your hands on how many of you use Wikipedia on a daily basis, most of you would probably raise your hands even if you secretly wouldn't want to admit it. And opening up a cultural, uh, your, your, your content through open licenses that those images are able to be used on millions of Wikipedia articles in over 350 different languages and more people are going to see those images that, and the objects from your collection than they ever would on your website, and frankly, than they ever will when they come through your institution. And I, I think that just has such a powerful influence and, and also kind of makes you look like 
a truly open institution, which in my opinion, all cultural institutions are here to serve, serve the public, right? And if we're not sharing the, the cultural heritage materials with the world, then uh, we're not doing our job. And, and one more quick little thing is a lot of institutions release their content on Flickr, which is an, a media repository for, for photography and things like that. And the really cool thing about that is not only are we able to download those images and, and use high resolution images without having to go through your staff or your website, but I've, I've been talking to, to archivists and curators from around the world who say, we post a photograph from our archives and all of a sudden it travels around and people start to say, that's my grandfather in that photograph. And you start to have your collections and what's curated for you with this unique history that you maybe could have never found unless you release your content openly. There's so many great examples of that. And, um, but actually maybe that's a chance to pivot to one of these other big issues. Um, uh, and I'll, maybe I'll direct this to Peter at this point. And I can see um, out of the corner of my eye I'm being messaged about questions that are queuing up. So um, I'll try and spy those out of the corner of my eye and, and go. But, but um, Peter, there's always this question about when uh, institutions put their collections online and open up and, and allow um, uh, their, their beloved images to flow into the public domain, that they'll lose control and that people will do bad things. Um, how did you all at the National Gallery of Art negotiate those issues and come to terms with them? So that's a really great question, and it was one that when we started Open Access I thought would come up quite a bit more in terms of resistance, but the reality is the Internet's been around for you know a, baj a bajillion years. We have our collections online. Images of our collection are already out there. So all we really needed to do was show curators, show staff, and say, look at all these lousy images that are out there that other people are controlling that are putting out there. So we're not doing ourselves any favors mm -hmm. and really that was the motivation. There was really no resistance from my institution. Everyone thought this was a great idea. It just became a question of you know how do you actually achieve this? But people weren't worried about being gatekeepers in that sense. I think that's you know kind of a uh, Fortunately, a, an idea that's kind of going by the wayside. We haven't, we've been up for three years. We haven't seen anything terrible. In fact, just one quick anecdote. I was really excited. There's a new TV show called Last Man Standing on Fox, and there were a ton of our images in it. There were a ton of images from the Getty. That's awesome. I love that. I mean, it's, you know, a guy spilled the beer on a Rembrandt. I thought that was, you know, <laughs> horrifying, but also sort of funny. So I'm glad to see these things out in the culture. That's great. You're reminding me of that quote from Taco Divitz, the curatorial director at the Rights Museum, who said, we want people to reuse our images. If they want to make toilet paper out of our paintings, I want it to be the highest quality toilet paper they can make. Yeah, that's 100% of you know, our approach. And we, want, we make amazing. I'm, you know, I'm thrilled to work with these great photographers. We have these great images. We want them out there and available. Peter, save a minute. We've sort of skipped uh, the headline. Um, what did you all do? So what we were looking at is we started a digital imaging program at the National Gallery in about 2004 and we had created this pool of very high quality publication images. But our rights and reproduction pass, uh, practices, just like Rob was saying, were very much grounded in transparencies and this idea of lending images. And they weren't it wasn't modern. It needed to be modernized and to take advantage. What we were seeing a lot of was people wanted self-serve. They wanted High school students wanted images for websites, you know, people wanted to do different things with them and we realized we needed to set up some sort of repository for that. So that was really the sort of the beginning conversation which I believe was around 2008. It took us, you know, some time to get to that point but once we got there I think we just kind of went all in. And we're really fortunate to have a very unrestrictive access policy for our images in that the images are available for any use. So truly, truly no barriers. If you, like I said, if you want to put it on a TV show, fine. You want to put it on a shower curtain, fine. You know, that sort of thing, we don't get in the way, and that's been, uh, I think, a big part of the success. Hey, maybe, um, actually, one thought. Um, in our planning over the months to do this uh, Hangout, um, Diane, Peter, Sarah, and Rob, uh, and a bunch of people we work with have, have put together some links and references, and I know that Amelia and the smart uh, people over at the AAM uh, uh, and the New Media Consortium have posted those links somewhere. Um, I will just look at my dashboard here and assume that uh, we're tweeting that link out on the uh, AAM underscore NMC hashtag. Okay. That 
makes me want to jump over to uh, Diane over at the Creative Commons and maybe throw you a little bit of a curveball. Um, uh, help us understand the range of options that institutions have for uh, works that they either own outright or that are really, really, really old or otherwise maybe works of government in the U.S. otherwise should be in the, in the public domain. What, what, what are the options? Well, in terms of Creative Commons, um, just to back up, I just want to echo something Rob said at the initial part of this call, which is um, one of the things that our licenses generally do is we provide, um, we, we allow people not to have to spend the time and energy figuring out um, the multiple options, whether that's the licensor or the people who are reusing images. Uh, you know, what Creative Commons does for people is allow um, us to and, and them all to eliminate the intermediary and eliminate having to study licenses because our licenses are standard. Um, so we do have um, two sets of, of tools. We have six licenses and we have two public domain tools. Our licenses sit between um, the default um, in the United States and everywhere else of all rights reserved and the public domain, which is um, either a work that has fallen into the public domain or, or as I prefer to think of it as graduated to the public domain or works that never should have been in the public domain in the first place. And then how one can relinquish rights to something that is currently under copyright or works that just have never been in copyright. So two buckets of, of tools that we have. One is our licenses for works that have rights associated with them. And another bucket for works that either the creator doesn't want to claim any rights in or don't have, there are no existing rights in them. And so our licenses um, come down to a couple of elements only. And, um, and what we found over the many years that Creative Commons has been around is that I, th I think we got our elements right. Um, so um, I don't know if many people know this, but at the beginnings of Creative Commons, we actually had a license that didn't require attribution. And we quickly determined that that license set never got picked up and used because, after all, all artists, all people who create, at least want the option of requiring attribution. And so, what, attrib what, is that, what is attribution? Attribution that is mean? the means to be associated with your work as a condition of someone else reproducing it in a way that copyright doesn't otherwise allow. So to be named as an author, which also correlates with moral rights in many countries around the world. It's also um, some marking requirements, the right to require people to link back to your original work, um, and the right to insist that a copy of the license or a link to the license be associated with your work. So attribution is both an association and then some marking pieces that are under our licenses. So all six of our licenses require that. And, and that's a requirement that if you don't abide by it, then um, you're not supposed to be exercising those rights as a matter of copyright. So attribution is core. And then there are a couple of other options. Um, there's the non-commercial and commercial option. Um, we have um, non-commercial licenses which prohibit use of a work if primarily intended for commercial advantage or gain. Um, those licenses used to be our most popular licenses and then have been eclipsed recently in a couple of areas in particular. Um, the no derivatives license says that um, you can reproduce my work for commercial or non-commercial purposes depending on whether you pull in the NC element, um, but just don't change it in a way that creates a new work as a matter of copyright. And then there's the share alike option. And this is what um, Sarah has talked about and we'll talk about more, but um, share alike is a way of requiring people when they make a copy of your work and then they build on it to create a new work, that they have to share back those contributions with the larger world. So Wikipedia has this as their license of default. Um, you can upload just attribution only licenses, licensed works to Wikimedia as well, and also public domain works, but by SA is their gold standard. I'm a small museum somewhere, and we have a work that we own the copyright for. Mm -hmm. So all of this, of course, a big part of this process is uh, working with your internal staff, your curators, if you have someone who does rights and reproductions, to understand what you do and don't own. But I work in a small museum, I know we own this body of content. 
is the is it that I can use Creative Commons licenses to in advance give everyone the right to reuse the, reuse those that thing under certain conditions? So that depends on the terms of acquisition that you have from the original artist or the estate or whomever was the donor of the work to your museum. And so for everyone on the call and in this Hangout, um, it's really important to understand what rights you have. Um, if it is a true assignment of all copyright and related rights, then of Let's course you have the permission. Yeah, as, as a museum yeah. to to license it as you will and and that's when you have um, a really beautiful suite of options to choose from um, from our most liberal license which is the by license to um, our most conservative license which is require attribution don't allow anyone to commercialize it and don't allow anyone to change it um, I would encourage museums which have a uh, a public-minded mission to consider if they do in fact own all of the rights to a work to think about how um, the more liberal your license choice is the more um, the more um, you can accelerate its review and use by uh, the global public let me turn that over to Peter then and I'm gonna say an administrative note there's so many questions coming in it's like the sidebar that we see is just like a blur so I'm gonna ask Amelia um, Wong from uh, the AAM and the uh, Media and Technology Committee. Amelia, in about 10 minutes, I'm going to call on you to come on mic and pitch a couple of these questions. Um, and I promise that we'll, uh, we'll review them all afterwards, too, and, and publish some answers somewhere. So I don't want to leave anyone out, but it's like I'm riveted by what our colleagues are saying, and I, I can't multitask that effectively. So, um, Peter, you guys at the National Gallery of Art, um, probably in the US you could have claimed ownership over the images you released and put a Creative Commons license around them but instead you chose to uh, put them into the public domain what are the differences between those two things and why did you do that so just for a point of clarification I think we we really were careful to not make any declarative statement what our open access policy says is that we presume that these uh, objects are in the public domain and we're making the images available but we're not necessarily asserting one way or the other and that's really more a question for you know our legal team that look closely at this we absolutely respect artist rights we absolutely respect copyright we're very conservative at the same time we didn't want to introduce anything that might be a barrier or confusion and I think uh, Creative Commons is a great option and it's a great way to go but for our institution, we wanted a plain language policy that was just very clear and very upfront that people could look at and they could understand. And we're certainly, um, uh, you know, I think Creative Commons is fantastic and I think it's a great option, particularly for works that may be under copyright where artists might want to make them available. But in our case, it, the open access policy was something we kind of wrote ourselves and kind of grew out of our own institutional needs. Yeah. And, and, and what does it... Um, what do you actually, uh, let me think how to pitch this question. Um, if I'm coming, if I'm an artist or graphic designer, actually I think I saw one of your pictures go by on the side of a metro bus the other yeah, day. Right. Um, um, if I'm a graphic designer, if I'm making a, the next killer iPhone app, if I'm a student, if I'm a scholar, I go to your open images site. What are my the obligations on me before I make my uh, next uh, million dollars on National Gallery of Art? image coffee cups or something? It, it was very important for us to be unambiguous. We did not want, part of it is practical, you know, the more people who write to us, you know, that's, that's an institutional burden, but we also just wanted people to understand what they could. We didn't want to have a lot of, you can do this, but you can't have text, and we didn't, particularly in 2012, it was quite a bit different. I mean, this was, it's hard to believe now, but this idea of open access and open content was so new back then and people didn't really know entirely what it meant so we wanted to be you know very clear so there are some you know there's some comments on there we're, we're careful about endorsements you know you using our name and that sort of thing but otherwise you're free to do whatever you like with these images we really I know the title of this hangout is open licensing but we really stepped aside as Rob mentioned earlier from this idea of licensing we don't get into use we provide images yep. and we, it's up to you to use those images. Okay, and I see in the sidebar that Diane was raising her hand. Do you want to? Do you want to jump in, Diane? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in super quick. So, um, 
I think that uh, in terms of uh, the no known copyright restrictions that a lot of people are using, um, we have you know I completely respect those. In fact, when I was drafting our public domain mark. I examined every single one of those on Flickr comments to figure out, you know, what is it that institutions feel that they need in order to make a general statement about no known copyrights. And, um, and so as beautiful as all of those statements are, there are some benefits to using the Creative Commons public domain mark, which essentially does the same thing. I mean, we modeled it, after all, on those. And so this goes to both of our all of our licenses and our public domain tools. Um, we express all of our tools, including our public domain mark, um, in several ways. For our licenses and our public domain dedication, um, which I'd love to talk about a little bit later, um, we express it in a really robust legal code that is understandable internationally, is translated into official languages around the world, and, um, and lawyers trust those. Um, we also have a human readable layer to our, our um, all of our legal tools. Um, this is where the public domain mark comes in. Again, we modeled that after the known known rights restrictions that Flickr Commons was using commonly. And then I think that's what what's really um, key is that we do have this machine readable layer to all of our legal tools. And what this layer does is it allows these works to travel around the internet and be searched for and have the right statements that are associated with those works read by computers so that people who reuse them understand, oh, it's identified, it's licensed under a CC license or under CC0 or a public domain mark has been applied and so you can search by it um, and it also expresses that to the reusers and so I think you know these things I, I completely respect decisions to create um, no known rights restrictions uh, statements but um, there are some benefits to using what is a pretty robust public domain mark that also has these other benefits to it. So I'm gonna go um, uh, um, I'm going to add on to that for a second and get to Sarah about image quality and check in with Rob and then we're going to jump over to Amelia who's been collecting questions from the, the, the uh, cyberspace. Um, and Diane, that machine readable thing, is that what makes it possible? Um, some listeners may not know this, when you go to Google and you search on images, you can select just images that are labeled for reuse which is like the most awesome tool ever if you're making PowerPoints or presentations or anything. Is that how Google knows what is and isn't Creative Commons licensed? Yes, so there's an advanced search feature on Google that allows you to do that. Yahoo used to have it. I, I can't remember if that's now in place again, but what it is is it's, um, it's information that computers can read so that if you have an interface for users that enable searching for those parameters, you can uh, have a return search which says, here are Creative Commons licensed works or here's works that are marked with a Creative Commons public domain tool. Um, as, as part of your result. We also do have um, a, a couple of, there are some that specifically facilitate CC search. Um, Flickr does a great job of this. You can go to Flickr, there's a subdomain for Flickr which is Creative Commons and if you go there you can actually search by license type introducing the image parameters that you want for for the search. And I'll say that one of the great things about Flickr and one of the great things about Europeana uh, and a lot of other websites uh, they, with every image, they'll show in a really straightforward way what you can and can't do with that image. You'll see a CC by mark or a public domain mark. It's just fantastic. Um, but what do you get? That's I know something that Sarah does a lot of work with organizations who want to want more exposure on Wikipedia, want to encourage scholarship. Sarah, do you want to say a few words about image quality or just? to freestyle in any direction you think we need to go now? You know I could go all day, right? So uh, one of my big obsessions and uh, passions is, is making sure that cultural institutions are, have their artwork and, and the beautiful holdings uh, that they have represented appropriately on the internet. So if you Google, let's say, Van Gogh self-portrait, you'll know when you, when you do the Google image search and this remarkable collection of like 10,000 gabillion images of Van Gogh, and every single one, even though it's the same exact painting, it's like a different shade of blue, right? So it's like 30 shades of, of Van Gogh blue, right? So 
one of the biggest challenges is that you already know that the internet is going to have a thousand different colors of your artworks and that people are going to go and take them and use them. And the, co the image quality generally sucks, just to be blunt. You know, a pixelated, uh, low resolution. Um, it's, it's a photograph. My favorite are photographs that uh, visitors take, and then they upload them to Wikipedia. So you have this beautiful Seurat painting, and it's represented with this really cool, blown-out, blurry, weird uh, photograph from some guy's iPhone uh, on the Wikipedia article about the painting. So by openly licensing and releasing your content material, you're not only doing an honor to the artists and the historical figures that we represent and write about, but uh, and, and the artworks they've created or the objects that they've created, you're also doing a, a, a favor to the public so we can get the real deal, and our toilet paper doesn't have pixelated Rembrandts on it. It has a beautiful quality Rembrandt, right? And... Uh, and, and, and you're the final voice. You're the official voice. You want your branding to be the best on the internet because that's where people go to find you. So by having the proper painting represented with a high quality image that is free for people to reuse, that's the first one they're going to go to because you're the authority on that artwork. Do, and yeah. Do, do you want to? You're, uh, um, you're reminding me of something that Lizzie Young, the uh, data manager at the Rikes Museum, said a couple of years ago about their drive to do the highest quality, highest fidelity online images, she said, our job is to tell the truth. Absolutely, and, 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 and it's, it's, we, we are financially supporting these institutions so that they don't, are not only caring for these objects, but representing them appropriately. And, and by not releasing this content, you're going to have 10,000 different shades of Van Gogh self-portraits, and that's just how it's going to go. So by releasing those images, it's going to eventually be the first thing you see on Wikipedia and on Google Image Search. Just look at the yellow milkmaid. You know. right. and you'll see that link in the um, in the document that the uh, is going out under the AAM underscore NMC hashtag. A link to a study called um, the story of the yellow milkmaid. I think it's a, it's a, talks about exactly what Sarah is talking about. And Sarah has a Tumblr um, uh, of uh, that covers that topic. Um, and uh, um, I'm going to jump over to Amelia who has some questions. We want to get Rob back into the conversation. I know she's got some great stuff from uh, the Twitter stream. And then I'll say, um, uh, for the last maybe five or ten minutes of this presentation, uh, each of the panelists is going to talk about specifically something that you can do tomorrow to start working on open licensing and open content in the public domain, and something you can maybe do over the next five or six months. So we're going to try and get this really practical for you right at the end. Um, so, Amelia Wong, um, uh, pitch some questions here. Um, well, we've got a lot of great stuff coming in from the back channel um, that just speaks to the huge potential and, and variety of issues um, that relate to this conversation. I'm going to start first with a question from Danielle about um, if anyone has uh, examples of the applications of open licensing in relation to K-12 curriculum education, student projects. And this is a somewhat uh, related question in terms of uh, discerning what those applications could be. Joris Peckle had a question about how institutions might be tracing back where their images are showing up. Um, do you use reverse image search and have you found anything interesting? So whoever wants to field those. Let's go with that K through 12 um, question, and I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but I know that um, uh, one of Diane's colleagues, um, Cable Green, works on open education with the Creative Commons organization. Open Education, or OER, Open Education Resources, um, uses open content from our organizations yes. to make better, bigger, cheaper, more accessible, more change-worthy um, uh, textbooks, classes, many people know the uh, MIT Open Courseware Project and similar initiatives. Diane, or if any of you, I'm, I'm look, making eye contact with your little beautiful little icons down there, wink at me if any of you wants to jump in there. Otherwise I'll let Diane hold forth for a minute. Oh, Peter's got a little wink. Diane, you want to say a few things and turn it to Peter? Well, I, I yeah, certainly. So I'll just say that there's no question that open licensing is enormously powerful in the OER K through 12 and also upper ed uh, world. Um, Cable Green is absolutely our expert on that inside of Creative Commons. Um, I will say that um, 
what is what is wonderful is to empower teachers and educators to take content, the best content that they can find anywhere, um, whether it's from museums or um, libraries or what have you, and enable them and empower them to take that and implant that into their open educational resources. And it's only because of open licensing that they're able to do that. Um, what teachers do not have time for and what students don't have um, time for and their parents, frankly, anymore don't have the risk tolerance for is going out onto the internet and just pulling down anything that they find and reusing it. Um, so it's a, it's a powerful tool and the more that galleries, libraries, um, archives and museums are able to leverage Creative Commons licenses and, and means for making them free and openly available, know that teachers are going to be going to you for the definitive most beautiful print as Sarah has indicated. Know that they're going to be pulling them into your resources repurposing them in the classroom, translating those for um, uses that you can't even imagine in far-flung areas of the world where the resources get translated or explained in a, in a language that you never anticipated. Um, and it's extraordinarily powerful and, uh, and I would ar uh, argue a critical piece for the success of um, both museums and their continuing relevance um, in what is increasingly an open educational resourced world. And so, Am, am I correct that the Creative Commons uh, website has uh, case studies about um, uses of, of uh, all kinds of cultural materials openly licensed and in the public domain that um, help grow and scale education? Absolutely. So there are a variety of links in the materials and on the Facebook page that you've been provided with from Amelia. You'll find lots of resources there and if you don't find anything that you need to find there, please contact me and I'll put you in touch with Cable or anybody else at our organization who really is, are the go-to experts for you know, leading case examples. Yep. Um, but museums play a really important part in that for all of the reasons that Sarah and I have talked about. Peter, Rob, Sarah, do either of you want to uh, address that topic or take another question? I'd love to just real quick dive into that question, which is just two things. One, for institutions, don't forget about uh, policies only, you know, very important, of course, but make your images easy to get. You know, provide tools for educators. Um, the National Gallery of Art, of course, does a great job, but so do places like the Getty and LACMA. You know, there's just make those materials beyond just images but your own resources and then for the users of those images if you're developing course materials keep that in mind where you got those images don't lock up your course materials this is a great age for teachers share what you're doing talk about your writing put if you're writing about one of our paintings we want to hear about it we want to know what your thoughts are how you're communicating this to your students and I'm, I'm remembering Rob you work in an educational institution <laughs> What is the, what is the, um, uh, has there been an impact of this on teaching and learning at uh, Wesleyan University? Uh, well, we, to be frank, we don't have measurable uh, information about that just yet. Uh, this is fresh enough and we're rolling it out um, in these chunks of content year over year in a way where, uh, where we currently stand is we do have uh, download logs that show us people are, are getting hold of these things. Uh, I think in a, to, to use a technical term as a metaphor, I think there's a little propagation delay of a sort, which is to say um, people tend to grab these images down. They're probably also uh, finding other uh, image resources from other providers as well. And I think then there's some time as people are building those into teaching materials and such that we would then hear about. Um, I'd, I'll just say looping back to a different piece of this question, uh, that one of the ways in which we do try to find out what uh, people are doing with these images, aside from uh, just knowing that they're downloading them, uh, is the policy in an in a optional kind of way uh, does ask that people who use images out on the web use a standard little phrase, DAC open access image from the Davison Art Center at Wesleyan University, which is in part a, a credit uh, sort of thing, uh, but it's also in a more practical way uh, looping back kind of way enables us then to search for that phrase and find places where an image has been used. Um, and we also just let people know that we're very happy to, to hear anecdotal uh, tales of what they may have used an image for. Um, yeah. What we purposely don't do, I'll just say, is interpose any sort of requirement 
um, in the process of downloading an image somebody has discovered in our collection search where they have to fill out a web form or register or tell us what they're doing with it uh, because that would introduce a kind of friction to that process which is uh, something we're actually trying to minimize. We want to make it as easy as possible for them to get it and then we want to, uh, whenever possible, uh, find out what cool things they're doing with it. Yeah, and that's, I'll say also, we often make the mistake that we think people just want one of our images. Often research requires uh, someone to download hundreds of our images, or maybe even thousands of them. And uh, forward-thinking institutions that have built APIs, application programming interfaces around their collections, allow for this kind of bulk download, which enables a whole new kind of scholarship that we've just never been able to do before. Um, I'm going to uh, look quickly for my uh, taskmasters. Um, somebody uh, who's, pay, who's pay, paying more attention to the, the sidebar here, Amelia, tell me what I should do now. Well, we've got about 13 minutes left, and if we want to end with um, kind of the examples of what people can do next, we should transition to that soon, but we can probably answer at least one more question. Um, in particular, um, Jeff Insko, um, uh, had a question about the difference between open image licensing and open data licensing and asked if someone could address that in relation to these issues. Do you want to um, do you want to take that Sarah? Sure, I love my data. Um, I'm, I'm gonna make it a, a big assumption that everybody who's listening here knows what metadata is. Uh, many of you often work with collections so it's uh, one of the first things you've kind of got to know about if you're going to be working with collections and collections management systems. Uh, so the metadata is basically the invisible, uh, it's the inside of, 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 a, of a, an object, right? So you have your digitized picture and then you have all the stuff that's wrapped up inside of it digitally. So that the name of maybe uh, who donated the object, the name of the object itself, when it was painted, who created it, how big the image is, how small it is, etc. And uh, Michael gets very excited about metadata. We have a chat up here, and he went, ooh, metadata! It's Sorry, I'm being distracting. It's, I, I, it's okay, it's okay. I, I get excited about it, too. So, you know, you have your open licensing for your image, so that's for the picture of the artwork of the object itself. And that, of course, is the creative reuse. We're allowed to download it for free, put it on Wikipedia, whatever. With the data, the stuff that's inside of that artwork or, ob or image, not only does it allow for a more unique form of uh, reuse. So hackathons, the Walters Art Museum in Baltimore uh, recently had their second uh, Walters hackathon where they re have released all of their metadata uh, under Creative Commons Zero license, which I will probably have Diane explain in detail or briefly uh, in a second. And that allows anybody to basically reuse the metadata uh, however they want without having to cite it because no one should really have to cite the source for uh, uh, metadata. And we can take that information, we can also take the image, uh, the artwork, and we can hack it. We can make uh, applications, iPhone applications with it. We can, um, oh my gosh, it's, we can put it on Wikidata, which is the newest Wikimedia Foundation project, which is a linked open data project for every single Wikimedia project instead of it, including Wikipedia which is basically going to be the greatest database of, of metadata and free knowledge uh, on Earth. It's remarkable. Check it out, wikidata.com or .org. And, uh, yeah, so it's basically like you're freely licensing the data behind the image. Let me um, add, a, add a point to that that I hadn't thought of, and thank you, Jeffrey, for that question, that great answer, Sarah. Um, open licensing, open content, public domain doesn't just apply to artworks or scientific data or... Um, uh, sort of our collections, it also applies to the, our websites, um, our blog posts, the comments that our visitors make around objects, um, the crowdsourcing projects, all of those things you can look at in your institution as being a kind of content that in the old days you would probably own because it was too inconvenient to let everyone in the world have access to it. But uh, I think everyone on the panel will agree that you can look at that content, you know, you can look at the terms of use on your website and decide to explicitly give people permission to reuse that content without without having to buy a license from you or without having to check with you. Um, and that's something the Walters Art Museum did. They put a license on their website where you can reuse the text, you can reuse the curatorial data, as long as you attribute the Walters Art Museum. Absolutely, and the Walters, I'll remind people, is not a big institution. Um, 
Uh, the uh, Europeana is Europe's cultural digital aggregator. Uh, they have over 20 million, probably close to 30 million records of artworks from all over Europe now. They release the metadata under a CC0 license. And Diane, quickly, you want to uh, clue us in about what a CC0 is, and then maybe we'll um, I'll check in with Amelia, and we'll go down the line and uh, talk about uh, what everyone listening to the call is going to do in the next couple days. Sure. So to keep this really short um, and most relevant to this audience, there are two reasons why you should care about what CC0 is. Um, CC0 is a public domain dedication, and it was originally conceived to sort of clear up some fuzzy edges of copyright um, where things were protected or not. And so our original use case was specifically around things like um, highly factual data that might be expressed in a way that might attract some copyright in some weird way under someone's laws that um, have very minimal standards, etc. So, um, as Sarah was explaining, metadata, I always talk about metadata as it's data about data. So it's providing basic information and largely that is not copyrightable. Um, using CC0 is a ticket to entrance to Europeana and to um, the Digital Public Library of America. These are institutions or aggregators of this great information. If you want to play in those fields, you need to be able to dedicate your metadata, the data about data, to the public domain using CC0. So that's one reason why everyone on this call should care about learning about that. The second reason that's an important to know about CC0 is as you digitize works that are in the public domain in particular, but any work for that matter, um, there is what we call a thin layer of copyright that may attach to digitizations of any work, whether or not it's in the public domain. And many forward-looking museums and institutions are thinking, you know, let's eliminate that thin, you know, uh, uncertainty about copyright that applies to a digitalization, a truthful reproduction of a work. Um, and so a lot of museums are starting to now use CC0 and apply those to at least their layer of copyright in any work so that people can rest assured they can use the public domain work or at least um, if the underlying work is still in copyright, they don't have to worry about a second layer of copyright on top of the original copyright that the underlying artist may still hold. So um, two reasons for everyone here to care about it. Metadata, licensing it under CC0 um, is a barrier to entry. It's a ticket to entry to Europeana and DPLA. And um, think hard before you start asserting copyright or licensing works once you start to digitize works where really you have no um, solid business model for doing so and you just want to give assurance to the public that they can look to at least only the underlying copyright if any in the work that's been digitized. And Diane, of course, no, no, di thank you Diane. And Diane of course mentioned the DPLA which is the Digital Public Library of America which is a fascinating project uh, designed to create a Digital Public Library of America and of course to make that work they rely on all the contributing institutions to have a level playing field with um, rights and access. Um, Amelia, uh, we have about six minutes left. Um, uh, shall we go to, uh, shall we go down the line or um, is there another question we can pick up? We do have um, a question from Neil Stimler asking specifically about how can museums encourage contemporary artists to um, share or I guess when they um, have their work acquired with museums to have it have it okayed under CC for this type of use. Um, That's a great question. Does anyone uh, want to jump in on that? I think I think I could say briefly that it's a great question and um, a lot of thought and effort is going into uh, works of art that are born digital. So they start their lives as digital objects uh, and of um, asking artists and asking donors when they give a work to an institution to allow that work to um, have a life on the internet uh, under a Creative Commons license or actually to be in the public domain. Uh, also the Wikipedia uh, Glam community has some great case stories about um, going back to individual artists whose, whose estates or who they themselves have asserted very strong copyright 
and asked for them to relax copyright so that works could go into Wikipedia articles. They've almost always said yes and enjoyed terrific exposure and result in public good as a result of that. Um, so that being said, uh, one or two notes. One is there's a terrific long, fast Twitter stream going in the background. We're going to create a Storify summary of that. And there's some real, true experts and deep thinkers there. Um, I wish we had time to talk to all of them. Uh, and I'll say that that's been one of the great joys of learning about open content for me, is that the community is so welcoming and, I guess, no surprise, open, um, uh, that it's really a great place to learn. Uh, it's a global community, pretty much every language on Earth, um, and just very welcoming and, and supportive. So definitely check out the hashtag um, uh, AAM underscore NMC, and we'll be posting a Storify of all this later. So that being said, um, I'll go from my right to left, starting with Sarah. Is that OK? Um, we, uh, we want to talk about something that the listeners can do in the short term, the next day or two, and then something over the next several months. What do you got, Sarah? Sure. Well, just something quick that you can start to do is if you are a Twitter user, and if you're not, you probably should become one, at least for the sake of following a couple hashtags, uh, hashtag open glam, O-P-E-N-G-L-A-M, and hashtag glam wiki, G-L-A-M-W-I-K-I. That is basically where all the people on the internet who are into this stuff talk about it. Uh, I mean, it's everything. You can ask questions, you can meet other people, and a lot of the people who are thought leaders, including many of us, uh, on Twitter, uh, talking about Open Glam and Glam Wiki, which is the Wikipedia partnerships. Uh, something you could do in the, in, the, in, the, in the future. I would say, you know, visit openglam.org, visit glamwiki.org, and get in touch. You can get in touch with someone like me. Uh, I lecture about this. I I meet with people around the world and, and have the pleasure to be able to help a lot of you open up your collections. So just get in touch and say, hey, I, I want to try this. I have some low-hanging fruit in my collection, and I'd like to see how we can share it. Get in touch with people. That's really, really great. Rob? So uh, time is flying. I'll just say one thing you could do really soon, which is even if it seems too intimidating or as though there'd be too many internal uh, administrative hurdles to doing something on a uh, collection-wide or institution-wide basis, uh, think about one object in your collection that you know people love to use images of, that you know is in the public domain, and think about whether you might just declare a high-resolution image of that one thing uh, free for everybody to use, either with a CC license or with a first version of an internal policy or just a no known rights restriction statement and uh, put it out there. See what happens. Uh, if you want to move it forward for more objects, then you would have something concrete to point to um, about the wonderful things people have done with this one thing that was, uh, as Sarah said, the low-hanging fruit. That's a great answer. Peter? I would just say, I know we're short on time, so I'll just say um, take yourself outside of your institution and go through the process of requesting an image as if you were <laughs> writing a journal article. And, um, See how that process goes. And if it hurts, then maybe that's something you need to look at. That's a, that's a great a great one. Thumbs up to that. Um, Diane? Well, it, you know, so hard to, to write on the coattails of all of these great ideas my colleagues have here. Um, I think that one of the single most important things you can do is um, find someone who is your contemporary or your peer in another organization. Um, lots of, you know, if you go to Flickr, Commons, for example, or you take, please take a look at um, Creative Commons um, latest and greatest slide set with a lot of examples of institutions who are leveraging them. I mean, it, it's overwhelming. There's no question about it. Um, so I completely support, you know, find a peer, start really, really small. Um, find one or two things and and just the buzzword um, that we have found successful with a lot of museums and libraries and archives is pilot. Use the word pilot. Um, use something that is uh, that you expect to get a lot of traction to, that you are simple in terms of copyright rights, so something that you own all the rights to or in the public domain. Experiment, and then once you show that the sky doesn't fall, um, then that's sort of a gateway into you know, experimenting with a larger policy or what have you. But um, most importantly, talk to your contemporaries and peers. 
that's you you remind me and it's it would it's a little um it's a little devious of me or a little uh tricky of me to try and end on this note but you guys know I've been saying for years think big start small move fast Amelia you want to wrap it yeah, great. Thank you, Michael, um, Peter, Sarah, Diane, and Rob. You guys are great. I mean, clearly the discussion today shows that this is um, such a large issue, and this is just a beginning for media and technology and new media consortium to address these issues. Um, to that end, I also want to thank our audience. You've been sharing amazing resources and also uh, speak to the range of things we can address in future programs. Uh, to help us do that, uh, we're sharing an eval link both through Twitter and the Q&A. Um, please take a few minutes to fill that out and give us some feedback so we can improve future programs but also decide how to move forward. Um, one of our goals today was to help people build their network and awareness on resources of this issue. Um, I know what we've covered today is a lot, um, kind of scratches the surface, but we hope to do more of this in the future um, and encourage you to keep in touch with the panelists through Twitter um, and keep using the hashtag AAM underscore NMC so we can keep track of those comments and ideas. Um, and I just want to thank you for joining us today and hope you stay tuned for future programs. Thanks a lot. You're great. All right. Pose for a selfie, everyone. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Thanks, guys. Oh, wait. No, I need to redo it. Don't go yet. <laughs> the sticky thumbs. All right. Ready? Smile. <laughs> there. All right. Excellent. Bye, everyone.